and welcome to this Reclaiming Digital Futures uh, webinar series. Um, this uh, is one of several webinars that we are doing to go deep and delve into some of the themes and ideas that came from the Reclaiming Digital Futures Toolkit. Um, this was uh, 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 came from a, a, a long project by the Susan Crown Exchange, and we have a we have a great group of people to talk to today uh, about informal uh, learning and the roles that data can play uh, within within the context. Um, so uh, first off, we have uh, Geraldine Rodriguez. Uh, she's from the Knowledge House. And uh, we have uh, Jeremy Dunn and Taylor Baines from the Chicago Public Library. And we also have Rafi Santo, who uh, alongside myself and June Ann uh, were some of the researchers that, you know, that worked uh, on, this, on this project. Um, so, uh, Geraldine, uh, first off, let's start with, with you. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do, what your role is at the Knowledge House? And, um, and yeah, you know, like, uh, what was your... Uh, experience working in this project. I'm the co-founder and CEO at the Knowledge House and we're located in the South Bronx. We provide technology education to young people. So we serve 14 to 30 year olds through three programs. Uh, we have an exploring technology program for high school youth uh, that provides crash course skills in various technologies. And then we have an intro to technology program for adults and then advanced job training for adults. I'd say what makes us different is that because we operate these three programs, both in the K through 12 and adult workforce space, um, we are sustaining the pipeline that way. Whereas other organizations might have programs only in the K through 12 space or only in adult workforce, we uh, want to fill the gap and make sure students don't get left behind uh, by their transition from K through 12 to post-secondary. Great. And let's continue with the introductions. We have uh, Jeremy and Taylor from the Chicago Public Library. Um, if you guys could introduce yourselves very briefly and, you know, tell the good people out there what you guys do. Great. Um, my name is Jeremy Dunn, Director of Team Services at Chicago Public Library. And um, I'll let Taylor uh, introduce herself and then we'll tell you about our organization. And I'm Taylor Bayless, and I'm a librarian in the Teen Services Department at Chicago Public Library. So the U Media program actually started 10 years ago this week. Um, and this program is a digital media learning lab that's inserted into a public library um, that gives teens access to you know, myriad digital technologies and trained mentors who help them uh, pursue their own interest. And uh, at this point in 2019, uh, we have expanded from, a, uh, from one location uh, 10 years ago to now um, 19 operating locations throughout uh, Chicago Public Libraries, which is composed of about 81 branches. So we've had really amazing growth in the past five or six years, and we'll be adding more in the coming months. Cool, cool. Let's uh, let's move to talk a little bit about uh, what brings us here, which is which is data and how um, how data is being used by your organizations and how uh, it can be used by by other organizations in the informal learning space. Um, and this is kind of a, a moving target and a, and a and a new story, which is really interesting, right? Uh, data traditionally has been used, uh, particularly in the in the um, out of school or informal learning space, as more summative. Uh, you know, uh, for funding purposes or for, you know, accountability. Um, but your organizations are um, actually using it in a more formative way, right? Kind of informing your day-to-day -day practices. And, and uh, that's very much some of the things that we got to see um, on, on, on some of our research and what's represented in the, in the, in the toolkit. Um, so I want to start asking uh, you, Geraldine, uh, what are some of the ways in which you see data being used to inform the actions and the work that uh, you guys do in your programs? So at the Knowledge House, we use data every day. Um, we are looking at our core outcomes and the progress towards those outcomes that we promise our students and funders. Um, 
But as we're looking at progress, we're also tracking certain indicators to figure out, oh, this program is not working. We need to course correct here. Sometimes we can like pivot or iterate or improve um, before a course is done or like at the end of the program, we evaluate to figure out how to improve it for the next round. So at the Knowledge House, the staff look at uh, weekly outcomes data. We have a tracker and um, during my check-ins with the managers, I can see um, attendance data that's updated, which students are behind on their assignments or are behind on their uh, grade point averages. And then week to week, the case managers are, you know, providing interventions, assigning office hours and tutoring, etc. cetera. Um, I'd say on a quarterly basis, the organization steps back and we look at qualitative data like student feedback. We look at non-programmatic data, like where are we with our fundraising targets. Um, I have the responsibility to report this data quarterly to my board. And then beyond that, at the uh, staff retreats, we do something called the state of TKH or the state of the knowledge house, where I'm able to present to all staff, this is where we are. Um, this is where we need to go to be successful this year. And we even start planning for the year ahead. Also, um, so we, we got to see one of your of your uh, kind of like data centered meetings, and and it, and it was and it was very interesting, and and uh, um, and I'd love you to try to paint a bit of a picture about that because the way that you guys were using data to to discuss and to talk and to kind of like jump not only from you know what the data itself is is saying, but how the data kind of like integrates into um, you know what our I mean, how the data can be used as a tool to talk about things, you know, like what are the challenges that students are going through and, uh, and you know, like why is this uh, student having uh, this issue this week was, uh, was pretty interesting. So uh, just because it's a very particular kind of ritual that you guys have, uh, and, I, and I think that's one that's very generative for organizations out there, uh, I would love if you could try to, you know, paint a picture about, you know, kind of like what is that, that procedure? Yeah, um, so the way that we've tracked data has evolved. I remember last year, every Friday during our team meetings, we would literally sit in front of a Google Doc and the Google Doc had the average attendance data, the average quiz data, and like the list of students, like the top five students and the um, lowest five students that need intervention. And we would have a half an hour conversation about this, this data. Um, I think it's very important for the team uh, to have a weekly routine where they're looking at data and like course correcting based on that data. I'd say months later, um, our data systems have become more sophisticated. And so now we have one weekly outcomes tracker. It's a really simple Google Sheets form. Um, but we can literally track attendance, assignment, and quiz data by cohort. And then for those programs that have ended, so for those graduates that are being placed into jobs or more advanced training, we can see weekly progress student by student, where they're interviewing, where they will be placed potentially. And so because we have this new system, the accountability structure is in place so that we don't need to spend our Friday team meetings having hour long conversations about data. Like now I expect the managers to course correct during their weekly managers meeting. I can meet with the program director weekly and course correct with her. And so we move those meetings to now monthly. So now every month as a team, not only are we looking at the monthly data, but now we're even tracking the like iterations that we did within the month and figuring out, all right, based on weeks one data, we made this change and we saw this result in week three. Did the change work? So I know, Gerilyn, one of the things that I saw when uh, we came and observed some of these data sharing routines that you guys have in the organizations, uh, in the organization, uh, was really kind of this fluid movement between looking at sort of more classic quantitative data, you know, like attendance or like, you know, which students are kind of at the top of the, uh, the curve and which students are having trouble and, and it sort of sparking a process 
of then talking about and sharing qualitative, uh, you know, you can call it qualitative data, but I was seeing a lot of just, you know, the educators in the organization, when you went from the quantitative data, you're bringing up like, oh yeah, that's what's going on with that kid. And like, oh, that actually raises this broader issue um, that we're seeing, or we're actually seeing in that partnership, you know, why is that number low? Like, oh, we're seeing in that partnership, we're having a lot of coordination challenges. And I'm, I'm curious about, you know, examples or stories of how um, you think about, you know, that, that highlight, that relationship between going from like what might be a, a simple number to something larger. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the uh, teaching and learning team at the Knowledge House, so these are our career and technical instructors, I would say they receive a lot of the live data. So in addition to attendance, assignment, and quiz scores, we're also collecting daily student feedback, literally daily. Like an exit ticket is that they have to fill out like a five-minute survey and share with us a challenge that they had in class, what they learned, what they were excited about, what they want to see improve. Um, so it's really important to have this qualitative data because it paints a better picture when you're trying to tell a full story. For example, um, if there is a week where I see that attendance is high, um, but the next week's quiz averages are low, I'm trying to understand if most students were present and they were there to receive the content, what happened? I'm able to then look at the uh, student feedback surveys and see on this day, the teacher wasn't giving it 100%, you know what I mean? Um, and then I am able to talk to the manager of the teaching and learning team to figure out what was happening, right? Is it something that the teacher needs to improve? Is it something that has to do with the curriculum? Or are students not clear on the expectations? So that's one example. I'll give you another example, which, which was really big for us. Um, during the recruitment uh, season last year, we were under enrolling. Like It became a pattern where we were under enrolling, and I had to figure out why. Now, student performance data, we do look at weekly. Recruitment data, we don't look at weekly if we're now recruiting for, for programs. But to figure out how to improve recruitment, I had to look at our social media data, right? I had to look at where we were posting the online application. Was it being reshared? Were people going to our website to look at this application? And when I figured out that was not happening, we actually said, okay, maybe we need a street team because the online recruitment isn't very effective. So maybe we need to go to community-based organizations, to housing projects, and put up flyers, right? We also saw from the application data that most of our applicants were being referred from current students or alumni, not social media, not the online application. And because of that, we um, implemented an, an alumni referral program where now alums actually get an incentive. It's $50. If they bring us a recruit and they successfully enroll, they get $50. And this year, enrollment was up by like a lot. Um, we were not having recruitment issues. Our alums were more engaged and I was able to work with our communications manager to make sure that we were improving our um, digital marketing strategies to drive more applicants. Cool. I, I love that thing you said about um, just how bringing up data would bring up, you know, kind of like the full picture, like the full story. And and I think one thing that you guys do that is different to the way that many other organizations work with the data is, you know, the fact that in that room you had literally every part of that story. You know, you had from the administrators to the to the to the teachers that are actually, you know, on the ground. Um, having those interactions with those uh, with the students and who could interpret and 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 uh, and talk about that data in a very different way um, and and actually yeah like you know it wasn't just an indicator um, it was just the 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 spark for for a full story um, about these things that were happening that you know that are more complex than what just you know that what just an Excel sheet um, tells you. Um, so one thing that some uh, that uh, organizations sometimes struggle with is the question about you know what kinds of data should you be collecting 
Um, so I don't know if you could talk a little bit about kind of what were some of the, what are, what, well, first of all, what data are you guys collecting? What's the data that, that you find kind of most uh, generative and, and if that has evolved um, and why? Yeah. So to summarize, um, the core outcomes of the Knowledge House programs include um, placement into a job or placement into an advanced tech training program. And so to track progress towards those core outcomes, regularly we're looking at attendance data, quiz scores, assignment completion data, because those are indicators that students will actually graduate. If, if students don't graduate, they can't get to the next job, right? Um, other than that, uh, we are looking at things during recruitment, like what cultural barriers to employment our applicants have. So we conduct something called the wellness survey and applicants are able to tell us before they enroll if they are justice involved, if they have a criminal record or if they're paying child support, for example, if they are at risk of homelessness, if they are on government assistance, because all of these um, potential barriers may prevent them from graduating. So if our case managers know from the beginning, these are the potential risks the student faces, we can put um, interventions in place or we can coach the student to really persist, right? We can identify wraparound service partners to help them um, by providing those services. Um, when it comes to the actual instruction, we are looking at those uh, daily student surveys where they rate their teachers, they let the teachers know what content is still challenging, what content they are understanding, and they just tell us if they're satisfied with the program or not. Um, when it comes to like uh, close to graduation time, we assess all of our students and we use a work readiness assessment. It's like a rubric that allows us to evaluate if the student is ready for a real interview, if they are ready to excel in the job, um, and if they're ready to really persist. Can they self-advocate for themselves? Can they negotiate for themselves to really persist through a three-month internship, for example? We use all of this data. Every team is in charge of specific data sets. Um, but we all bring the data together monthly. Um, we report quarterly and we have um, staff retreats twice a year where we step back and just look at this data collectively. I'm not gonna say that it's an easy, clean process. I think until the Knowledge House automates its data, um, we'll still be prioritizing what data points to look at weekly, you know what I mean? I just think it's important for every organization to be crystal clear on the core outcomes that makes their organization successful. So what is your theory of change, right? What are the core outcomes that ensures you're actually doing your theory of change? And then what are the indicators that lets you know, oof, I'm not meeting this outcome, I need to do something right now, or I am meeting this outcome, let me keep doing more of this. I think being crystal clear on the core outcomes and how you're tracking it and how often is really important. Wow, there's uh, there's so much to unwrap <laughs> from from what you just said. There's so many fascinating and, and very uh, rich stuff. I mean, first of all, I I, I just want to kind of like underscore uh, some 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 themes. Uh, I mean, the fact first of all that you kind of like look at students holistically. That you know that the first bit of data that, that you know that you mentioned that you guys were collecting is all of the stuff that is going on around with students around students' lives and and how that can impact uh, their learning. Um, I think is a great signal f to folks out there. Um, secondly, you know having having a, a means of uh, receiving feedback uh, from from the students continuously, having you know this this uh, this this channel where you can always understand you know what are some of the challenges the students might be having. And, and information for the um, for your instructors to be able to tailor you know their instruction to that particular group of students you know that they're having right then and there that's not the same as you know the one la the week before and the one the semester before um, I think that is also incredibly rich 
and and um, and also the fact that you guys are thinking you know immediately about you know kind of like what are the next steps and and what are some of the challenges you know besides the kind of like the just the instruction itself that you guys provided to the students you know what other things can get in their way um, when they're going out there into into the into the workforce um, I'm having that as part of your your mission I think that's that's uh, that's that's incredibly rich um, and and uh, kind of like going back to what you were saying about. Uh, you know that the way that each organization kind of does this is is of course you know uh, different and nuanced. Uh, we actually want to get some of that nuance, and 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 I would love to move the conversation a little bit to hear some of what um, you know Taylor and Jeremy uh, might have to say. So um, I'll, I'll, if anybody has joined in later, uh, Taylor uh, and and Jeremy are from the Chicago Public Library. Um, their their youth services, which are you know huge and and incredibly exciting. And um, I would I would love to ask you guys the same question that that, uh, that I asked Geraldine. Um, you know, what are some of the ways that you guys are using data in in your programs, and what's the what's the story and some of the changes that have gone uh, in the ways that you use data in in your programs? Yeah, um, I'll I'll kick this off um, real briefly, and then Taylor's going to kind of do a little deep dive about some of our data practices. Um, one thing that I think uh, is important to know, I think the, this uh, conversation with uh, the Knowledge House is really great because it provides such an interesting contrast. Our organization and the way that we provide programs uh, is you know, fundamentally different from the Knowledge House in that um, we're part of a public library and all of our programs with teens are completely drop-in. Um, we work with the teens that choose to come into our library each day. Um, and we do not have any sort of centralized curriculum. Um, our teen programs are designed by our library staff, whether they're at the far south of Chicago on 95th Street, um, you know, or on the west side, um, wherever they are, they are um, they're developing their own programs. And in terms of thinking about um, what you know, Geraldine was emphasizing about um, you know, core outcomes, um, when we think about our core outcomes at UMedia, um, it's really about um, are we, as a library staff and mentors, um, are we keeping the idea of interest-driven learning front and center as our North Star? And if we are, that means that teens are coming in and are able to do the things that they want to do or discover new interest and come up with a new idea of what they want to do. And then our staff support them by helping them develop a new skill, um, uh, build on that, um, share it with their friends who also have the same interest, um, find showcase opportunities uh, to have a broader audience for what they've done. If they're interested in that, they may not want an audience, they may just want to move on to something else. So that's really what we think about our core outcomes. In terms of our kind of universe of data, um, that's composed of one, um, maintaining attendance. Um, we do, our students do sign in when they come in, even though we're a drop-in program. So we know how many teens are coming into any of our branches every day, every month, every year. Um, if they're, you know, how many unique visits they make and how many total visits are happening across our entire system. Um, uh, the other forms of data that we um, uh, are, are really looking at closely and developing processes for using with our staff are survey data from our teen um, uh, participants. Um, and so uh, that is a process that we've been involved in now for probably a little more than two years, or coming up on two years. Taylor probably has an exact date. Um, and I'm gonna let Taylor kind of take it from here in terms of talking about what, what that survey tool is and how we use it with our staff um, to improve our programs. Yeah, so the survey tool um, we actually developed over a couple of years, we worked with an outside consultant who sat down with our staff and had really in-depth conversations to help us synthesize what our goals are. And we ended up breaking them down into personal, social, and academic goals for our youth. And then we started a process of developing a logic model. Um, and then after all of that work, 
we started developing the survey and trying to really figure out what are the questions that will help, you know, let us know, are we achieving our outcomes? Are we achieving these goals? Um, what are teens self-reporting? How do they feel about their learning and about their library spaces? So uh, in late 2017, we did a couple tests with some branches uh, to see how teens would react to, you know, taking these surveys in the first place. We did not have a history of asking our teens to do surveys at all. Um, and, you know, the teens actually were pretty cool with it. Uh, they were happy to take surveys. Um, and then what we did is we didn't, when we got the results from the teens, we didn't just give our staff, you know, these are all the answers to the questions. We gave them what teens answered. We gave them the raw data. But then with every question, we paired that with some like deeper thinking reflection questions. So like, look at this data, really think it through and talk it through. Um, so as we rolled this out to all of our staff, uh, we have monthly cluster meetings, which are professional development meetings where we get all of our staff together. And we sat down and grouped people together and asked them to really talk through all of their survey data and go question by question, you know, answer questions, try and surface things that they're seeing and come up with one actionable goal um, from everything that they were seeing in their survey data. And it worked really well uh, with our staff in the first round. So in 2018, we did quarterly surveys and we took time in each of our cluster meetings to reflect, compare uh, what they had seen from previous quarters and continue this process of trying to find an actionable goal within that data and work towards it. Um, that being said, it did take a lot of work trying to get buy-in from our staff, work that we're still doing. Uh, some of them are really embracing the surveys, really like looking at the data. Some of them, not as much. Um, so we're still really working on that buy-in and really trying to focus it on this is about improvement. This is about telling the story of what's happening in your space, of trying to come up with ways to improve your work. Uh, and it's really for you. Uh, I think a lot of our staff have a history of working in organizations where data is used punitively, and that is not what this is. This is just for them to improve their practices and make better spaces for our teams. I, I love what you said just there. Um, and, and yes, it very much goes to, to the heart of why, you know, sometimes in educational institutions, there's um, you know, challenges and some rejection to data, right? Because because uh, there's so much history, particularly in this country, with it being used in a punitive way in education, um, you know, being attached to funding or defunding um, and uh, and and how to reframe it and, and, and kind of like get our educators in a way that they feel comfortable and they can see it as, as something that, you know, that can indeed give them more power. Um, you know, is, is, is really cool. And I love some of the, uh, I just kind of want to highlight some of the, what I see, like, I guess, the tips in, in the, in what you just described, you know, the fact that you, you give that data back and you give the raw data and not just a summary. Um, I can see that kind of feeling less managerial, which is, you know, one of the challenges that we sometimes have with the sharing back of the data. Um, I love that it also kind of comes with some generative questions, you know, of like, you know, this is how we thought about the data, you know, like, Here's an invitation for you guys to think about it um, in, 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 in that way. Um, and uh, since it's an ongoing process, uh, my next question is, I would love to hear stories because I'm sure, you know, things have changed and that there must be like, you know, some anecdotes and, and uh, I don't know, like, you know, what, what happened when, when you started sharing all this survey data with, uh, with your stuff? Yeah, so I, it has changed a lot. We've actually... Uh, switched to just doing surveys twice a year, we were finding that teens and our staff were getting survey fatigue. Um, so that's one of the big changes. Um, we're also moving towards these reflection discussions being more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we have a system in our department where we have district liaisons. So I'm the liaison for all of our branches on the north side. And our plan is for me to sit down with 
my staff on the north side, and we really dig in one-on-one so it becomes more of a conversation rather than a bigger group conversation, a more one-on-one conversation um, to get to those actionable goals. Um, And in terms of stories of things that have changed, uh, one of our locations, Albany Park, they had some really interesting answers to questions. There was one question that was a pretty simple question on the survey. How many workshops have you done in the past three months? And the majority of the teens answered zero, which did not jibe with our attendance data. So the staff there was like, I don't get this. Why are they saying they haven't done anything? So it really started this question of, okay, so They're doing things. We know they're doing things. But why are they reporting that they're not doing anything? Do they see these activities as just a fun thing and not a workshop? Because it was called workshop in the question. Um, And after some follow-up conversations with teens, they started to realize that the teens didn't differentiate just sort of like their exploration time in the space from a scheduled workshop which was really great for us to know. You know, we don't want our spaces to look like school. And clearly they were, you know, succeeding in that. The teens were having fun, didn't see it as something, you know, like a class. Um, But also that information paired with another question, which asks students, uh, you know, how do, do you media activities connect to your future goals? And they mostly said no on that question. So that was really interesting to us to be like, oh, you know, what are their goals? What are the activities they're doing here? And what can we do as staff to make those connections to their futures more understandable? Um, So that was really interesting, I think. And the Albany Park staff made some real small switches in language, just the way that they would talk about things or when they would just, you know, throw in a fact here and there about like, hey, you know, you learned how to screen print. You know that you can do this if you, you know, record some music and you want to promote it. You can use screen printing. You can use these design skills in other ways. Um, So really trying to make more direct connections in their conversations, everyday conversations with teens. Yeah, and I, w- I would love to, to add on to that with a, another uh, example if we have time. Um, uh, first, I would, uh, before I do that, I would like to underline something that Taylor was talking about in terms of, you know, how ready are our staff to use the data? How do they feel about seeing things put into pie charts or bar graphs? Um, and what are some of the barriers to that? You know, in terms of uh, some of our experience, I think it, it, you know, it's interesting to think about, um, you know, librarians and um, our UMedia mentors who aren't necessarily librarians but have great affinity for librarians and, you know, are, are really people who want to be in the informal learning environment. I think if you were to put them, you know, in buckets, they would be in the bucket that's furthest away from the bucket that the accountants are in. Right, and when when we think about numbers, people often think about accountants, people who are counting something up, and they're going to make a decision. Oh, we're going to add to this, we're going to subtract to that, then we're going to make a decision because this is what we see, what's adding up. And as a rule, let me generalize. I would say librarians really don't like that idea at all. And so that's 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 one of our barriers in terms of thinking about okay, how do we humanize this? How do we humanize the fact that we're, we're collecting data, in this case, on what the teens are telling us? We know the librarians care about working with teens, otherwise they wouldn't be teen librarians. But there still can, can at times be a resistance to hearing what, they're, what, what, what their teens are saying. Um, and so what we really focus on is, how do we take that and, and, and as, as Juan Pablo noted in kind of summarizing what Taylor, how do we give them the power to ask questions, to ask good questions that can actually help them see how they can make changes? Um, so I just think that's really important to kind of repeat um, because it's something that we continue to think about as we try to integrate this into our ongoing peer learning practices. Um, so another uh, really interesting example, um, 
Chicago Public Library is aspiring to a join to join a collective um, a collective improvement um, organization here in Chicago um, called Thrive, which is uh, based off of a model I believe that started in Cleveland called Strive, where multiple organizations across the city are part of a um, collective data set, and then they have access to a dashboard um, to, to, to even see if teens that are coming to you media are also going to another program and, and what their experience is then. And, and that data set then connects in a black box with data from Chicago Public Schools as well. We aren't officially members of that because it's still going through the legal department, but we will be um, in due time. But as part of the onboarding in that, we went through a team uh, practice to, to learn a particular research-based model of um, using a design process um, to create a small test of change. And um, that was an interesting example um, where we took um, input from one of our surveys where one of our teens had mentioned that um, a, a recording studio um, didn't have good mentorship in terms of her being able to move to the next level in what she wanted to do. And so we took that response and thought about, okay, what are some possible solutions to this problem? What kind of small test of change can we incorporate into greater engagement of teens in our studio and then staff understanding what are the supports that those participants may need that they're not getting and then how would we how would we provide those supports um, so we we did a small test of change where our goal was to support staff to support teens to create um, recordings that could go on a new playlist that we would publicize and um, so it really focused staff on this one goal. Our outcome was to have teens produce things that ended up on a playlist. And so we used a design process over the course of about eight weeks to really kind of understand what kind of changes could we make. Fast forward to now, we, it, was, it was really successful. And we used the basis of that to apply for a larger grant. And you can see behind Taylor, um, we have the Teen Arts Mixtape, which was just released about eight weeks ago. Um, we had a team of teens who both recorded and produced art um, that became part of this new album that's now available on New Media SoundCloud. You can go download that now. Um, not only that, but the, the Teen Arts Mixtape group are taking their concert on the road to six different branches this summer. And we've applied for round two of that grant to scale our, our um, recording studio practices to more branches. So I think that that's a really exciting example of taking one survey response, which just highlighted something for us, gave us a focus, allowed us to do some tests and figure out how could we then grow that into a richer, um, more supportive program that's about um, teens getting into our studios and creating Recordings. Mm, I really love uh, I love those examples, Jeremy. Um, you know, they, they highlight two things for me um, that have been in the back of the, my mind during these conversations. Uh, one is just that uh, you know I think both of uh, your organizations, uh, the Knowledge House and Chicago Public Library, uh, have been sort of alluding to this practice of continuous improvement. We haven't really named it yet in the conversation, but pretty much. Um, I know knowing the histories of your organizations and knowing you know the kind of practice you just described of you know doing a small test of change, doing you know gathering data around it and then seeing if you can improve around it you know is very much uh, aligns with what we call um, you know plan do study act cycles or PDSA cycles that come from continuous improvement methodologies um, and and the other you know thing that came out from your example on this playlist was sort of you know in this conversation we haven't talked so much almost about um, the fact that we are coming from a very specific context of community-based digital learning programs, right? Um, it's almost like this conversation can be taking place in, you know, almost any organization, you know, practically for-profit, non-profit, you know. Um, it, and I guess a question that I have for you guys is where and how does the fact that uh, we're coming from a very particular uh, setting and set of traditions 
um, in community-based digital learning uh, that might change how um, the use of data uh, looks. And, and, you know, I'm kind of thinking about a couple of things here. One is, um, you know, the particular kinds of outcomes that we re that we track and what it means to try to track certain kinds of outcomes related to, um, you know, connected learning, community digital learning, uh, interest-driven learning, things like that. Um, but then also the fact that we're, we're coming from organizations that are, um, have sort of a youth leadership and youth development tradition and have young people actually not purely positioned as subjects and participants in programs, but actually as uh, shapers of uh, their, their work and shapers of what these organizations and programs kind of look like. And I know I kind of put a, a bunch of different things out, but I'm just thinking about whether you can speak to either of you uh, want to speak to this intersection between what the work is that we do in the kinds of organizations we've uh, featured in this project um, and how that intersects with data practices and where they might be different from they, how they might look in other contexts. Yeah, um, I, I think for uh, the U Media programs here at, at CPL, um, you know, in terms of, well, I'll start with your, your thought about, um, you know, youth being the shapers. Um, we, we do not have to work hard to um, get that uh, or to establish that with our staff because there's total, total buy-in for that model. They, they, they want their teens to, you know, to grow and to pursue things. Um, so I think, I don't know if this is answering your question, but the thought that I'm having is, um, <clears throat> I really think that is our way forward, really embracing that belief and that value um, in terms of how we continue to use data um, uh, that we collect uh, and share, uh, and then help staff formulate questions to think about, okay, what wh what's next? So um, this, this, this particular individual, um, you know, now has made a successful recording um, and is part of the mixtape. Um, you know, what what is the the next opportunity for them, and how how do we build on that? Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if that's an example where it's really drawing a contrast uh, in terms of how different organizations, but maybe maybe Geraldine or Taylor have something else to offer at this point. So at the Knowledge House, um, I have to work through a regular tension that I feel between the outcomes that are promised to funders and how we report that. Um, and then what my team understands as success, you know, I think because the Knowledge House straddles both worlds of like K through 12 informal STEM learning and workforce development, I constantly have to report various outcomes. Um, I'd say that the traditional workforce development funder really, really cares about full-time job placement and full-time job placement quickly. Um, and so at the Knowledge House, because our population is younger, um, we just don't don't have those those success stories. Our alums that are working full-time in tech at these big companies like Verizon, CNBC, um, it took them more than 12 months to become career ready to persist in full-time jobs. And so, especially in the past two years, as our staff have grown and our you know funding has increased, I've had to step back, look at the full data story at the Knowledge House. So what are the numbers saying? But then also like, how have we impacted each student, right? So even students that were served in 2018, if they don't have a full-time job right now, but they're not homeless anymore because they got some basic job training and now they're like at a minimum wage job and they were unemployed last year, like that's impact. And so using that as an example and like summarizing, like 
we promised you these outcomes, funder. We're still working towards meeting those outcomes. In the meantime, here's what we're learning and here's the data behind it. We have a handful of students that are on track to getting full-time jobs, but right now they're freelancing, making minimum wage, and because of that, they can now have roommates in an apartment, and last year they were homeless. You know, like, I have had to work with funders and, like, train them so that they understand what success stories look like, like, what's the impact that the Knowledge House has had, and I've had to train my staff to understand what funders expect, you know? So if on paper we are not meeting outcomes, um, like how can we tell a better story? How can we tell a full picture? What qualitative data do we have about where the student was before the Knowledge House, where they are after the Knowledge House, so that we can communicate all of those stories? I love that, and I love that it kind of brings us to uh, to some of the complexities, right? You know, um, we... we uh... <sighs> We, we generate the data and and, um, and 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 we generate plans for for continuous improvement as Rafi was saying but you know uh, organizations are in this you know cluster of systems that are very complex and have many many competing forces you know working um, so um, just before we go to our lightning round uh, I wanted to ask just one last question uh, which I think can be very useful for other organizations that are you know listening to us out there. Um, and I want to ask you guys if there's like any tips or, you know, a couple of things that you have learned that I think uh, that you think that would be rich for others out there um, when thinking about this space, when thinking about the, the space of like using data within your programs. I would say one piece of advice that I have uh, to organization leaders um, are to just be mindful that since you are the main person communicating to funders that are expecting all of these outcomes, and you know, over time, you may be um, less student facing, expect, right, staff, even students to think that you're data obsessed, right? Like you're coming into team meetings, asking for outcomes because you have to write a grant report. Like, that is a challenge that I have to overcome. And what I've done is like, I've been in the classroom more, right? So as part of quality assurance, I like go visit classrooms. I literally jot down teacher feedback. I give it to them. I say hi to the students. I also look at the student survey weekly to make sure that there aren't red flags because as I ask my team for this data, I don't want to seem like, I only care about numbers, right? Like there are faces behind these numbers. So I encourage every leader to learn that balance and make sure that they're paying attention to the qualitative data and the human faces, as well as the numbers and the reports to funders. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll just build on that. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I, and, and I think, um, you know, part of the dynamic at work there too is when when you know we're going to staff to saying you know okay you, you need this data um or don't forget to enter your data um uh, because we need these reports or we have this this funder who needs this report now um the gap that is often created is that the funder is getting the full report but the staff who are providing the programs they don't get the full report and their supervisors don't hmm. get the full report why not? Sometimes it's just capacity. It's just time. It's just, and so what does that mean for, for me and my administrative team? We need to build in those processes and we need to make sure that that reporting back to staff, to the facilitators, is supported not just by my team and team services, but by senior leadership at the library. And, 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 and that then is a way to actually build staff. Because I think the one thing that, that, we discover, and I put that in quotes, again and again, when we get feedback from staff is that they sometimes feel invisible. You know, they are in the trenches every day doing stuff. I, I shouldn't use a war metaphor in the trenches. They, they, are, they are in our libraries in 81 neighborhoods in Chicago, um, you know, doing programs every day and, uh, you know, living that. And so, um, 
you know, they need to be acknowledged and, 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 and you can never do enough, but we can, we can be, we can be better about that. So I really, I think that's, that's the advice that I would give to someone who is, as Gerilyn so eloquently put it, maintaining that balance, that tension uh, between all those people who need the data. Thank you so very much for uh, for those insights. And um, we're almost on time, uh, but just before we go, uh, we have a, like a lightning round of questions. Okay, so um, these are questions that you should all answer, and uh, just try to be as brief as possible. You know, one phrase, two phrases. Um, and the first one is: uh, What are three keywords for you when you think about data improvement? Um, I'll, I'll start. I would start with. Um, frame compelling questions. Gerilyn? I'll say metrics and indicators. Okay. What about you, Taylor? Um, it was a phrase that was already said earlier, continuous, continuous quality improvement. Okay. That's sort of like the next question that we had, which is what might be a motto for your team when thinking about data for improvement? Do we want to, do you want to leave it as your motto or, or do you want to create a, a different motto? I'll, I'll have a different motto. I mean, data helps us tell our story. That's great. Cool. Cool. Gerilyn? My motto is really a question. Anytime we're making a decision at the Knowledge House or we're trying to figure out why something has happened, I always ask, where's the data? Where is the data? Where's the data? <laughs> that's, that's very funny. Uh, okay, now, in one phrase, what's a key to improving your process in data improvement? I will start with that, and I will say, integrate practices into overall staff development processes. That's a great one. I definitely one plus that. Um, I would say for us, efficiency matters. So if you have the capacity to automate your data, that would be helpful. And, uh, and my last one is, what's one thing you feel that you could be doing more of to improve on, on data improvement? I'm going to go with what I said last before the lightning round started, um, that, um, reporting back to staff and their supervisors and making sure they are aware of the stories coming out of their programs that we're telling others that they they know those stories are being told as well and that they're part of those stories so um so we really have we're really lifting everybody up at the same time something that we've learned at the knowledge house is just um that alumni stories are very powerful so moving forward, we're trying to incorporate alumni uh, so that they can give us feedback, so that they can share testimonials with us. And we start telling those stories of success, which are not purely numbers. Great, great. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think this is gonna be like incredibly useful for other organizations. Um, before we go, I, I wanna I wanna give a call out to uh, to our, our work. Uh, it's, uh, the website is digitallearningpractices.org. Um, if you go there, you're gonna find the the um, the toolkit, reclaiming digital futures, and uh, it has a bunch of stories about data. It has uh, one really really cool description about the stuff that goes on in the knowledge house um, and uh, and and how data is worked there in their staff meetings. Um, it has um, other resources about how other organizations use data as well. Um, and um, just before we leave, uh, do you guys have like any, I don't know, projects or cool things that you might want to make the folks out there aware of uh, just before we close? I, I will just say um, we're happy to have people reach out to us if they'd like to see our survey tools or learn more about um, how we have uh, been trying to integrate these practices into our um, staff development. And as far as what we're doing, check out shypublib.org. Um, it has a full section on team services and new media. At the Knowledge House, we are looking back at five years worth of data, literally. Uh, we turned five years old in October, and right now we're working on a strategic planning process to really figure out what the next five years looks like. 
Um, and that includes national expansion, so that's very exciting. Um, and it's, you know, interesting to look at five years worth of data, but it's really exciting to use that data and plan out what the five years ahead look like. So it's exciting. Okay, so look for a knowledge how subsidiary coming to your neighborhood uh, soon. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for this. Uh, this has been an incredible conversation. Um, again, uh, check out Reclaiming Digital Futures uh, Toolkit. Uh, thank you so much, Geraldine, Jeremy, Taylor. Uh, this has been great. And uh, we'll see you folks on the next of this webinar series. Goodbye. Yeah.